Okay, well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for showing up and joining us in this meetup. Um, Zephyr has been sort of unique in the sense that it's one of the few open source projects, um, especially embedded projects, it's over 100,000 commits. And it's just been eight short years to make us this way. So it's been very exciting in some ways. So what I'd like to just do is, you know, people ask, okay, what's next? So that's a bit of the subject of this talk. So everyone here has heard about, uh, anyone who has not been exposed to Zephyr in some shape or form? Okay, well, the only thing I point out of this is, right from the start, safety and security. We started the project off with this. We started off trying to go for best practices and be modular and flexible, and these things have been paying off for us uh, as a project. And so here's the stats from last week, okay? I'll point out that there was over 300 contributors into Zephyr last month, in the last month, okay? Ups, you know, these are actually contributors in the code. And so some people, um, we've, in some ways, we've had more contributors in Zephyr in the last month than some of these other RTOSs have had in their lifetime, which is pretty impressive when you start to think about it from that perspective. So the people are using it, and it's turning into products. Um, if you want to check my numbers, go ahead. It's on GitHub. Um, and we're running about 2.6 commits per hour at this point in time in the repo. So there's a lot of churn, a lot of things going on, a lot of... Um, innovation happening. And if we start looking at the stats that we've been tracking, the unique contributors per month has been going up steadily. And so um, for those who are not on it, most of the community hangs out on Discord, and I'd encourage you to go there if you want to ask questions. But you know, we've been seeing over 8,000 contributors now there too, and people interacting on that. So it is a vibrant community, which was one of the goals right at the very start, which was to create a diversified, vibrant community that was focusing on these things. And in fact, one of the things that I was really excited to this summer see is, you can go look at this report yourself too if you want, CNCF Velocity. So the Cloud Native Foundation is busy chasing after Linux, okay? They think that they're gonna be, the Kubernetes is gonna be faster than Linux one of these days. So they run these stats. And as a byproduct of these stats, Zephyr, over a year period, is the fourth most active project now at the Linux Foundation, with over 1,000 developers contributing. And one, the, the other chart I've got, the other chart that's in this report that I didn't put up here, is actually of the top 30 open source projects overall, Zephyr's now number 28. So by doing best practices and following best practices for open source development, as well as having, you know, taking security seriously, I think this has fueled a lot of the growth. And the results now are we've got, you know, we've got thousands of products in the field. There's 6.5K forks. We don't know all the products, but given the number of forks, we figure we're probably getting around 1,000. Um, one of some of the things I'd like to, I think Susan's got an example of this one back there with Sean the Sheep. <laughs> and we've got some watches. Um, you know, wearable rings from Samsung are now using Zephyr. We found that one out recently. In fact, we found it out because of the Korean fact sheet and the French fact sheet. However, the US fact sheet didn't mention Zephyr, did not mention Zephyr. So it was sort of like, okay. <laughs> and then Zephyr, for those who have got familiar with history, Zephyr actually started from a project uh, called Viper that was being used in satellites. And as of August, Zephyr is now back in space. It's actually in a satellite, and it's there as the low firmware to bring things up and make them open. So we actually you know, now have Zephyr back in space, as well as you know, it's sitting in all the Chromebooks right now. Any, process, any of the PCs and so forth you're getting this year with the Intel Inside sticker are running Zephyr on their firmware, And so as of this year. And then the Framework laptop is a really cool open source laptop, and that's running Zephyr as are the keyboards and mice and so forth. So in addition to sort of like user, um, consumer products like hearing aids, we're seeing, you know, and wind turbines, we're seeing it across a wide spectrum at this point. So just to, you know, the hearing aids are there, um, the industrial side coming with the, the Vestas wind turbines. And I think I was seeing some as I was going to Austria on the train, <laughs> um, to, you know, um, finally in the field and then the turb, the laptops, 
we finding, you know, we're finding these interesting digital uh, ways <coughs> of um, working with Zephyr and basically combining these technologies to make these things all come together. So right now we're seeing over 750 boards supported and growing. And so if we ask the question, what's next? I don't see a reason this will be stopping. I think as more boards come available, I think you'll be seeing more boards coming out and being available with Zephyr. There's over 220 sensors already there. And again, I see more sensors being added all the time. I don't see any slowdown there. Um, we've got most of the major architectures. Um, we may see variants, more variants of these coming in. Um, but there's, you know, there's well over 700. And, uh, if you actually go onto Reno dashboard, um, you know, there's over 600 ARM boards at this point in time, you know, 32 bit ARMs, not well, 64. So we're seeing a lot of 32 and 64 bit processors um, available with Zephyr. And if we'll, see if we'll see if someone adds a new port, a new architecture port. There was a couple of discussions. I don't know if it's going to materialize into anything useful or not, but we'll see if they start showing up in the repo. So our last LTS release um, just happened this last July. And it's actually got a new hardware model in it. So we've been evolving in that thing. And we also have the PTP now. So again, more focus on getting towards the industrial side. The other thing that we've got um, to highlight is the um, SBOM generation. It's been extended to work with the PEARLs and CPEs a bit more, as well as more of the 2.3 features. So if you're caring about automatically generating these SBOMs, that's um, been enhanced a little bit more. But we've had it now for two and a half years. Um, and our next release is 4.0, and we'll be, and after two years, I'll be in the next 4.0 LTS. It's kind of how our cycle works. And so if you're curious more, there's these um, links to the blog post, and there's some release notes and so forth. And the cheat sheet here is, if you ever want to understand what we're focusing on as a project, we have our Kanban board. And um, there's lots and lots of detailed features, but the things that the release team is focusing on almost will show up down here. So if you're trying to understand what's going on for the roadmap for Zephyr, I'd go to this Kanban board. I put the link here. Um, it's right. It's Projects 13. <laughs> and just bring it up. And then you can sort of see, well, OK, is it going to make it in? To what's going to go into 4.1? What are we going to remove? So this is where the release team operates and tracks what's, what's important. And as you can see, we haven't pulled off the 3.7 yet. <laughs> but um, you know, some, of these, uh, some of these things, the POSIX stuff and some of that, are, didn't quite make it into the release. And so they'll be moved over. So I guess to bring it up, we've got a pretty vibrant ecosystem at this point in time. And that's continuing to grow. So my, my one ask for anyone here who's aware of any of these tools that are not on my, the next set of slides, um, come talk to me afterwards so that I can go about adding it up and making the ecosystem a little bit more visible, that would be lovely. Um, the architecture is continuing to grow component by component. And oops, I've got that one in there twice. And so the thing to realize is that 2.6 commits per hour is happening here. Okay. When we cut the LTS, that was a 3.7. And we'll probably be seeing like, you know, one or two updates per month based on security fixes, usually, or something that's deemed really critical security. So this doesn't change that much. This is there for people doing products to keep things stable. So if you don't need bleeding edge, probably should stick with that one, because that way you don't have to be tracking a whole bunch of interface shifts and so forth. That's why we put out LTSs. And we start this, this diagram essentially there right from the start of the project. Okay. And we followed this diagram, and it served us well, because we took the lesson from Linux. So a lot of this stuff is Linux. You know, was, um, the model worked for Linux, so we adopted it for Zephyr. Um, in terms of the security, um, we're continuing to refine our documentation. So um, we've got you know, trying to figure out whatever best practices we can find out there we're trying to adopt. Um, we've been a CVA numbering authority since 2017. The Linux kernel only became one last year, <laughs> this last year. So we've been, you know, having um, blazing this and making sure that we can keep Zephyr um, behaving well upstream. Um, again, 2019, we've been, had been one of the few projects. There's only about 10 or 12 now that have a gold badge. We were, I think, the fifth one to get our gold badge. Um, 
And then, um, you know, we have a registry for people who are doing products. Um, we're going to try to fix it within 30 days of knowing about a vulnerability. And then if you have a product, you can register for free and we'll notify you under embargo for 60 days. And I don't know of any other open source project that's trying to do that right now. Um, but we are trying to be very friendly to products. That's one of the focuses for Zephyr. And then, as we've said about the software supply chain, um, you know, uh, basically the project itself ships an SBOM, but anyone who builds with, S with Zephyr can effectively generate SBOMs for their products and for their ELF images and showing what's been generated, what's been linked, and then actually tracing it all the way back to the source files. Which, when you think about it, if you don't want to know uh, false positives for the security vulnerability side, this lets you say explicitly, is this file actually in my final image or not? Because if you've generated this type of level of detailed information, um, it lets you see that level and do the, that query and be authoritative. And we need that level for safety. Okay, This is where we're going from safety to. And to do these S-bombs, um, which is more and more important for the CRA at this point in time, but literally, those are the three commands. Okay, You're just turning it on. And you get three S-bombs. You get a source S-bomb for your Zephyr sources. You get an app, a, a source S-bomb for your app sources. And then the build one, which has the linking to the sources from the dot O's. So which dot O's are generated from which dot C's. And then how they've been combined. All the dot O's have been combined into your dot A's for your libraries. And then how they've been all combined into your final ELF image. So you have that detailed level of traceability. And we're going to continue to build on it. Um, with the SPDX 3.0 that's coming out now, there's more options for capturing build information so that we can get things more reproducible. And if you want to see this in action, I um, encourage you to go to uh, Renode's dashboard, where effectively anything that says built, passed, or generated has all those, those S-bombs in it. In fact, if you mouse over this little icon, it says just download the S-bombs and you can see it yourself. So this information is right there um, at your fingertips uh, across all this hardware block. So, you know, to summarize it up a little bit, you know, our security committee launched literally when the project launched, and it doesn't showing any. Um, and we found, and we actually created a working group specifically separated from the committee uh, to improve some of the transparency. But you know, we've got that vulnerability response criteria documented. We're doing the embargo notifications. We've got we are, we're CNA. And we've actually been working on the last year on some Etsy 303, 604, 64, 6, oh, God, I'm tired, 645 attestations. Um, so it's self attestation, attestations. So we've been, you know, doing these things and, you know, the gold badge um, has a lot of the best practices, again, publicly documented. And we started doing these SBOM generations in 2021. And so we've been able to do it pretty much since then. And we actually, this year, um, funded an audit as a project. And so we went and contracted the NCC group to do an audit, because they were the ones who before had audited us. And they found a whole bunch of things. So they saw about 20 of them. And all of a sudden, it was sort of like, oh, <laughs> OK. Um, and that's what changed some of our security processes. So we figured, OK, with this LTS coming out, let's go see if there's anything we really need to worry about. And they only came back with a couple of priority issues. So we really didn't, they didn't see too much this time around which is encouraging in one sense, but cost a lot on the other. <laughs> so uh, the world of security doesn't stand still, as I think most of you are aware. Um, the, CV, um, CV, the, MV, the National Vulnerability Database Infrastructure has been updating. There's new APIs. Um, we're continuing to work with updating our processes to work with that. Uh, looking at leveraging automation for security regressions. Um, we've just finished signing our contract with Bugsang, and so their um, coding guidelines scanning, which are based off of Misra, but have some variants, um, we'll be starting to do that automatically into the code base now. Um, and we've been doing weekly covariance scans for a long time now. So um, we've, got, you know, we've got challenges, though, as a project. And um, we're starting to look at the OpenSSF scorecards for the, around the security posture for improving the press practices. And so the security team has been looking at that, looking at the scorecard, and seeing, well, you know, does this make sense? Not you know, having those debates, and then working on figuring out what they want to do as a project. 
So summary wise, you know, we've got the Coverity scans, MISR scans, code checks on Paul's requests. We've got our practices documented and we can do the SBOM generation. So uh, a lot of the security best practices we know about um, are we're trying to apply. And if people know something that's missing, again, we're interested. Um, the current challenge right now, um, and it has been for a couple of years now, but we're making progress finally, is our safety engineering and trying to get after the V model with um, Zephyr. And so we're trying to actually pioneer gain that V model compliant analysis and have the feature specification and quite frankly, demonstrate that open source can be mapped to a compliance process. So we're trying to go in this direction. This is where you're gonna see um, people working in the community as well as a lot of effort being spent by the community. Oof, that was not a good overlay there. Anyhow, um, we're starting with the limited scope. Nicole will be talking more about this. I think the key takeaway I'd like you to take from this slide is we're trying to do all of the open. There's other projects that are working on safety, but they're doing it by companies and they're keeping some of the, either the, either the, uh, the, some of them are making the requirements visible, but we're making our requirements visible and we're making the traceability visible. We're trying to do that out in the open so that once we show a pattern, people can hopefully, if, we're, if they're missing what they want, they can contribute their analysis the same way they contribute code today. So if you care about something, you can hopefully add it in yourself if it's not there. So this is what we're working on right now. And we're using an open source tool called StrictDoc in the project to do the traceability and um, capture our requirements. So the catching the requirements and then doing the traceability is what we're doing here. And the safety working group is the one where we're doing the requirements capture and setting up the management system and driving the traceability. Uh, the committee itself is about what we're actually going after for a certification because they make the money, they make the recommendations to the board about what to fund. And so that's the two difference between the working group and the committee. And that one's available to members. And so with the ecosystem, we've been adding more IDEs recently. I still want to see IAR on this list. I really, 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 really want to see IAR on that list. I think that'll open some things up. Um, we've got a fair good coverage on uh, some of the tracing tools and some of the emulation. Obviously, you saw the dashboard from Renode a few minutes ago. We are starting to see um, training options come in. We've got um, various training partners, and I'm hoping to see a few more show up at some point in time. Okay, like, a guy smile. Yes, okay, fine. <laughs> and there's a variety of companies that are doing services and consulting, and I'm hoping that TNG will let me eventually use their logo, because I think they do it as well. Um, and so getting this up and visible is a challenge. Um, from the security perspective, um, for secure encryption, WolfSSL is working with us as embed TLS, is how we do this, that side. And we've got some um, machine learning. TensorFlow Lite and Edge Impulse are both working with Zephyr. And there's a variety of language runtimes that are now starting to work with us, as well as a variety of other firmware. So the ecosystem is building out slowly. Um, and again, if people know about things they're missing um, from remote management and management, we're seeing a lot of fleet deployment stuff with Zephyr, and the connectivity is basically happening there. Um, and then robotics, we've got ROS going with Zephyr. There's ports with ROS and Zephyr. So if people know of other things that are missing, please come talk to me. And I'd love to basically make sure we can get them added in here. So there's some links here to um, getting started guide and the community is on Discord. And there's a lot of device tube binding. So there's a pretty good chance what, what you're looking for will be there. And then this is just the participation information. So if you're not participating actively already, you know, join in on the discussions. And with that, I'll say thank you.